Paladin. Paladin? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was, he was a pretty good guy. That show really came about because of the Dick Boone television show. They decided they wanted to capitalize on the success of that show, of the TV show, so they decided to use the same scripts that had been used in the Boone show for the radio show. But unfortunately, they did not work out. So we uh, scrapped the whole thing, and everything that was done on Have Gun, Will Travel on the radio was original. And as far as the character is concerned, what is there to say? But he was a grand and glorious, heroic, magnificent, wonderful, masculine, strong-hearted... And magnificently played. Magnetic, yes. <laughs> character. <laughs> That's all. Welcome to Breaking Walls, episode 136. My name is James Scully. Tonight on Breaking Walls, we spotlight John Daner and Have Gun Will Travel. If this is your first time listening to Breaking Walls, welcome to the show. You can find this series on every podcasting platform and at thewallbreakers.com. Tonight's opening theme song is George Winston's Living in the Country from his 1991 album, Summer. Join the Breaking Walls Facebook group to keep in touch with news, snippets, photos, and other additions to the podcast at facebook.com slash groups slash the wallbreakers. And the first eight chapters of Burning Gotham are out everywhere you can get a podcast and at burninggotham.com. It has been named an official 2022 Tribeca Audio Selection. You can also support these shows for as little as $1 per month at patreon.com slash thewallbreakers. My career as an actor... uh has been spotty. I started out in New York in 1935. I starved my way through the Depression in New York as an actor. I came out to California in 1940, January. Went to work at Disney as Mm -hmm. an artist. And I was an assistant animator on Bambi. And then I I, I went into the Army, got out of the Army, was hired by KMPC. I went into radio, you see. John Daner was born John Forkham on November 23, 1915 in Staten Island, New York. His father, Leroy, was an artist. His career allowed John to attend school in Norway and France. John was also a gifted artist and pianist. He studied at the Grand Central School of Art in New York while simultaneously getting into acting. Forkham's talent took him west. He found animation work at Disney before landing a job at KMPC. At the radio station, John did everything from dramatic work to newscasting. He later earned the Peabody Award for his coverage of the first UN conference. KMPC was such a part of my my soul, my life. But I began when KMPC was a little, wonderful Spanish house in Beverly Hills. That's right, he was a private owner in Beverly Hills. Yeah, and he also owned uh, WGAR in Detroit, G.A. Richards. Dare I ask roughly the time period? Yeah, this was about 42. And what were you doing there? You were a newscaster? No, I started out as an announcer. Then I became an actor, of all things, on a show called The Hermit's Cave. It was a staple. I was, played the hermit. He cackled a lot. Then I became a newscaster. 
Then I became news editor in 1942 or 43 around there. This is Robert St. John in the NBC newsroom in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, we may be approaching a fateful hour. All night long, bulletins have been pouring in from Berlin claiming that D-Day is here, claiming that the invasion of Western Europe has begun. Uh, Let me read you several of the latest bulletins. One says that a report, unconfirmed by allied sources, of course, says that heavy fighting is taking place between the... He spent the last half of World War II in the Army. After being honorably discharged, he returned to California. Now using his mother's maiden name, Daner, he hoped to act. I drifted, just drifted back into acting. Every radio personality or person or who had been an actor or who was an actor in radio all wanted to be actors in motion pictures. I became an actor in motion pictures. I drifted into that business. At the same time, I drifted back into radio acting. Lawrence Dobkin remembered how difficult it was for an outsider to find Hollywood work. Uh, Hollywood radio, radio on the West Coast, was very closely knit. I remember working regularly on East Coast radio, and I told a group of people I was coming to the West Coast for a lot of reasons. Three or four of my good friends in New York radio said, you're going to be very hard-pressed to earn a living. They will not let you in. You're going to have a rough time. You don't know what a closed shop that is. It starts with the directors, the actors, but basically the directors and the writers have a very rigid attitude toward incoming talent, much more than New York. And I was getting this from uh, Ted DeCorsia, Santos Ortega, you know, the guys I was working with. I found that to be quite true. I came out from New York with my own series on ABC. I was starring in the show. Uh-huh. Ellery Queen. I was the 11th or 12th Ellery. And the show provided me with, you know, a foothold, and I felt quite comfortable because I thought, they cannot ignore me. I am here I'm doing star. a show every week, and they must hear it, and they must allow me entry and give me auditions, etc. Not so. It was enormously difficult. And... Lillian's experience with a Bill Spear saying, nope, is quite typical. I think it was Norman MacDonald, not with Gunsmoke, but something else, who f- was the first West Coast director to allow me in to his normal casting procedure. And then Dwight Hauser, rest in peace at ABC. After that, it became a little easier. But when but Ellery Norman was not that air, entrenched. I mean, when we no, started, he was, he was sort of a beginner himself. That's right. And I think that helped. He was more flexible. But Daner had good timing. Thanks to William Paley's package program initiative, CBS was piloting dozens of shows. By 1948, he was a regular on the network, where a new crop of directors like Elliot Lewis and Norman MacDonald joined veterans like Bill Robeson and Bill Spear. On August 1st, Daner appeared on Escape in Bill Robeson's production of The Man Who Would Be King. Fed up with the everyday grind, tired out from the summer heat. Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are making your painful way over the great India desert, alone and dying of thirst. While behind you, pursuing you, are the fanatical Kafirs who once bowed to you as king and now call for your life. Tonight, we escape to India and two soldiers of fortune who pushed fate too far, as Rudyard Kipling told it in his famous story, The Man Who Would Be King.
One Saturday night, it was my unpleasant duty to put the paper to bed alone. It was a pitchy black night, as stifling as a night can be in India in June. It was very still, save for the ticking of the clock above my desk, which seemed to shatter the black heat of the night as the hands crept toward 3 a.m. And then from the passage outside my door, I heard voices. Well, who's there? Only us. And who are you? Oh, so you don't remember us, eh? Mm, no, I can't oh, how say about that. The Jodhpur I... border, then. Jodhpur border. Yeah, and having the authorities turn us back for impersonating newspaper men. Newspaper men. And man? then there was the train. Yeah, off of which you had us thrown, if I remember correct. Oh wait, that flaming red hair, that bald head. <laughs> oh, Daniel Dravot and <laughs> Peachy Carnahan. <laughs> the same. Well, what do you two want <laughs> this time? If it's money, I haven't got it. And if it's a fight, it's too beastly hot. Yeah, can rest yourself easy, sir. Because we have come asking for naught except some information. We've been all over this country. And we've concluded that India isn't big enough for such as Daniel and me. So, we are going away to be kings. Kings in our own divine right. What? Aye, we shall be kings. Yeah, we've signed a solemn contract. Each to help the other... And neither of us to look at liquor or women until we have become king. I've never heard of such a fantastic idea. Well, what do you want of me? Naught but a look at such maps of Kafiristan as you might have about. Maps of Kafiristan? That's where we decided to go. Well, don't you realize that not one single Englishman has ever gone into the Kafiristan mountains and lived at Mount again? You're a good deal more likely to become dead men than kings. Yeah, we all shall Anyway, see. I don't believe you have the slightest intention of travelling a mile outside of Delhi. Then you should come down to the Sarai marketplace in the morning, down where the caravans leave for the north. Now look, look you two, I'm a newsman, not a nomad. Now why, why should I come down to that filthy pest hole? I'm not so sure that you're either. Well, what do you mean? You say you're a newsman, but here's the chance to see the start of the greatest story of all time. And you'd pass it up. Because you're too blasted lazy to get up that early in the morning. Come along, Drevet, me lad. Yeah, but if you should have a change of heart, come to the Serai in the morning and see whether we'd be liars or not. And so they left, those two lovable scoundrels. And I sat Well, Escape was an anthology show. And the truly brilliant thinking of show business at the time, since suspense was such a success... <laughs> Why not another show of the same kind? So Escape was pretty darn close to suspense, and very often we used the same material. The assistant director, who was Norman MacDonald for most of the Escape series, when I was doing it, the assistant director's function was to time the rehearsals, time the show, and while on the air, advise the director how he was running fast or slow, etc., and generally to take care of the mechanical end of the production. I used the finest actors in Hollywood. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison, or the grave. This time, a platinum wristwatch, a body on a lonely strip of beach, and a case of heart failure in a Beverly Hills garage all added up to blackmail, 25 years old, and a killer would never be caught. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. On April 11, 1950, Daner appeared in an episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. It was noted because Bill Conrad subbed for Gerald Moore. The, whole talking about the, great 1950 Ford. the pair's relationship went back to their days at KMPC. One interesting sideline that Mr. Daner mentioned to me off the air was that he was at KMPC with the man who starred in Gunsmoke, William Conrad. They both worked oh, yeah. at KMPC back, back in the 40s. 42, 43. Wow. Bill was, uh, uh, he read poetry. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine that, though, oh, with yeah. that voice, that oh, he would yes, be fantastic. Yeah. I bet he would have been. How yeah. Many, how many Another great radio voice. Oh, we were, oh, gee, we were so innocent. We thought we were so great. We turn left at the next corner, Cabby. Okay. 
Boy, this Beverly Hills in the sunny afternoon is really something, ain't it? Yeah. Wide streets, classy homes. Boy, these jokers got it made. Some life. Nothing ever gets to them to bother them except the income tax, maybe. Yeah. Here it is, mister. 8834 Beverly Road. What a joint. Yeah. Um, wait for me, huh? Sure, sure, mister. <laughs> The door was answered by a girl of about 16, a tall, slender girl with dark eyes, too deep for her years. Oh, come in, won't you? I believe Dad's expecting you. She led me across a living room as dignified as the lobby of a bank to a door that she opened. If you'll wait here in the library, I'll tell Dad you've come. The library of Stanley Towner, my new client, was as somber as his living room, except for one thing. Over a fireplace that half filled one wall was a life-size portrait of a woman. A most beautiful woman. Could have been a painting of what the girl who had just left would look like in another 25 years. I was still staring at the picture when Stanley Tarner came in. That's a portrait of Margaret, my wife. We lost her one week ago today. I'm sorry, Mr. Tarner. Well, we'd been expecting it for over a year. The doctors had warned us, but... <laughs> Even when you're braced for a blow like that, it... Uh, yes, I know what you mean. It was her heart, Marlowe. She was coming home from a shopping trip in Westwood last Tuesday evening when it happened. She had her own car and was just pulling into the garage here when the attack seized her. Catherine, my daughter, and I both heard her car hit the garage wall. We ran out and found her. The doctor did everything possible. But Wednesday morning, she was, she was dead. I'm, I'm sorry. It's all right, Mr. Tommy. I must tell you all this because the... The reason I called you here has to do with Margaret's death. I don't understand. I, I, I've I got to get Mar Margaret's watch back. A what? A watch? Yes, a wristwatch. It's, um... Uh, well, I'll try to explain. I loved my wife very deeply, Marlowe. Now that I've lost her, the most important thing in the world to me is the preservation of her memory. Can you understand that? Well, it's natural that you'd cling to things that remind you of her, Mr. Towner. Uh, now, what about the watch? It, it's lost. Somewhere in Camino Beach. You know where that is? Yes, a few miles below Redondo. Yes, that's right. Well, the day Margaret died, I had taken her watch with me to have it repaired. I went down the coast on some business, and on the way back, I stopped at Camino Beach for lunch. A place called the Trade Winds. You had the watch with you when you went in? Yes, in my overcoat pocket. I came out and got in my car and was halfway back to my office before I realized it was gone. I, I've i got to get it back, Marlowe. How much is it worth? In cash, about $500. But to me, now, it's it's worth 20 times that. Uh, what's the watch like? It's a Benarus, platinum, and set with emeralds. Mm -hmm. I gave it to Margaret on our 20th wedding anniversary. There's an inscription on the back... To Margaret from Stanley with eternal love. Now, I know that watch is somewhere in Camino Beach. Can you find it and bring it back here to me? There's nothing more you can tell me? Well, unfortunately, that's all there is. I'll do my best. But uh, I can't guarantee a thing. By the early 1950s, Daner had appeared on the NBC University Theater, The Screen Director's Playhouse, Escape, and The Whistler. And headed for the ocean. The horror story of all horror stories for me. It was George Allen, wasn't it, who produced The Whistler? Yes. Okay. Didn't we have two shows, one for the West Coast and then another TC, uh, on separate days? No. No. Same, Same day. A few hours later, whatever the just difference in time. I was into horses at the time. I did the show. I had the lead, did the show, went to the stable, saddled up, climbed aboard the horse, rode across the bridge, through the boondocks, up into Griffith Park, clippity-clop, clippity-clop, hours later, suddenly the blood left my face. <laughs> I said, holy God, I'm on the air. <laughs> I'm sitting on a horse in the middle of Griffith Park. Now, what do you do? Nothing. You just clippity-clop back. <laughs> Rush to the studio. Tell us the truth, you know, except that you say there was a... The horse got a pebble between his hoof and his shoe. 
George says, it's all right, John, fine. We've covered you. Everything's okay. And I said, oh, God, <laughs> thank you, thank you. It happened a second time. The same damn thing. Maybe six months later, on a horse, blank. <laughs> God, I'm on the air. Can you imagine? Why did you get away from it that time? Yes. <laughs> and he, he kept hiring me. I, I gave him some excuse, and he said, It's all right, John. We're covered. Everything was fine. And I kept working for George. Daner became a regular on Gunsmoke after its 1952 debut. This is from the December 7, 1952 episode called The Cabin. And I waited. Then I pounded again. Then the door came open and the figure stood in the light. Who are you? Bring him in, LV. Any man out in that weather's been made harmless. Get inside. Out of the way, Alvy, you fool. All right, stranger, hands in the air. Hi. That's better. Unload him, Alvy. Nice gun, Hack. Real nice gun. Shut up. Now take him down, stranger. You can come up to the stove now, but don't try nothing. I'll cut you in half with buckshot. He was a burly man with flushed cheeks and a wild red beard and a great shock of red hair. Even his hands and fingers bristled with it. He sat on a stool by the stove, a shotgun across his knees. And his eyes never left me. The other one, Alvy. Had a body of an underfed boy, but he was completely bald, and his skin was tight and dry. He looked like a naked skull, and his eyes, well, something had touched Alvy. You look half froze, stranger. You must have wanted something real bad to go out in weather like this. I never saw him around here before. In those days, it was an absolute ball. We'd do two shows on the Saturday. We'd do one in the morning, go to lunch, and there'd be one in the afternoon. And the total, we'd probably start at 11 and be through by 3.30 or 4 or something like that. It was joyful. It really was. Everybody looked forward to coming to work. Daner spent the next six years playing a variety of parts on shows like Gunsmoke and Johnny Dollar. He was a toothless drunk, a dashing leading man, a vile psychopath, a pillar of the community, and a no-nonsense anti-hero. Oh, they were the most happy, because for one thing, we all knew each other. Once the show was established, and uh, we were rather established as a group, we worked so well together, we knew what the other's reactions were going to be, and we felt at ease personally with each other. For instance, we'd come to work in the morning, and we wouldn't get down to the first reading for an hour. We'd be sitting around with Danish and coffee, jabbering, just having a marvelous time. It is from this kind of intimate relationship with the other actors, the other people, let alone being actors on the show, allowed you a tremendous inner freedom, a relaxation, a feeling of comfort, that there was no tension at all. In 1955, Gunsmoke's success led CBS and director Norman MacDonald to launch a second adult western called Fort Laramie. John Daner auditioned for the lead on July 25th, 1955. And a walk. Oh, oh. And a trap. Oh, oh. Oh. And back, get it. Get it. Fort Laramie, starring John Daner as Captain Lee Quince. 
Tales of the dark and tragic ground of the wild frontier. The saga of fighting men who rode the rim of empire. And the dramatic story of Lee Quince, Captain of Cavalry. Sergeant Gorse. Yes, sir. Pass the word to dismount and unsaddle. All right, Captain. I'm going up on that little knoll. Maybe I can see Mr. Seibert's party from there. I'll be right back. Yes, sir. This mountain on saddle, been grazed water. This mountain on saddle, been grazed water. All right. But he was worried about being typecast, and Captain Lee Quince went to Raymond Burr. With no sponsorship, Fort Laramie only lasted 10 months before being canceled after the October 28, 1956 episode. I did every accent known to man. South Slobovian, East Yemeni, and I did it with absolute perfection because nobody knew what they sounded like. <laughs> Not a soul. The director or producer said, well, can you do this and that? And he said, of course I can. And you did it? And he said, beautiful. Because he didn't know what it was <laughs> supposed to sound like. Gunsmoke remained CBS's only Western until February of 1958, when Daner was cast as J.B. Kendall in Anthony Ellis's production of Frontier Gentlemen. Kendall was an English journalist writing for the London Times, weaving his way through the, we- weaving his way through the Western territories of the U.S. in the late 19th century. The only background I can give about him is, is what I know about him from my personal experience, having met him, but only in Hollywood. I didn't know very much about his background before he arrived here. No, I didn't he know. He was English, that. you know. He's English, yes. And his mother was Effie Kalish, a pianist. As a matter of fact, she taught me piano. She came over here with the English pianist by the name of Solomon and brought her family and her husband, who was also her agent. Tony was very musically inclined, and music played a very important part in his, not only the production, but in the writing, in his mind. He wrote musically in many respects. Tempo meant a great deal. Dynamics meant a a great deal to Tony. He was a very, very broad, very warm, very kind, lovely, lovely man. A very sensitive man. Extremely sensitive, yes, absolutely. My hotel room was a palace in comparison to the cabin on the riverboat. After cleaning up, I went downstairs to the saloon bar in the hotel, ordered a drink before dinner. The place was practically empty, but I wasn't alone for long. Hi. You're the English fella, aren't you? Kendall? Yes, that's right. I'm Lila. I work here. Frank Clanton said be nice to you. I'm being nice. You want to buy me a drink? It's on Frank. Oh, delighted, delighted. Uh, bartender... Champagne, Harry. Yeah. Um, Frank says it's not ladylike to drink whiskey. Hey, what'd you do to that man? I never seen him like this. He thinks I'm going to write about him for my paper. Are you? More than likely. You gonna write about me, too? <laughs> if you want me to. I'm Dake Farley's girl. Dake doesn't like you. He got mad when Frank said to be nice to you. Does everybody in South Sunday do what Clanton tells them to do? Sure. Why? Here's a drink. Oh. Well, good luck. Uh, Look here, Lila. What about Clanton? You seem like a nice fella. Don't ask questions. Well, what about you, then? Me? What do you care? Where are you from? I was born in Ohio. Got married and came out west. Five years back, my husband got killed in a gunfight. I don't know. I kind of drifted around. Ended up here, one place as good as the next. Is it? Yeah, I guess. What about you? Your home's in England, huh? It was. You one of them lords or dukes or something? <laughs> no, not exactly. Married? No, no, no. Must be interesting traveling around, seeing new things. Oh, it has its advantages. But I suppose you'll be glad to get back home. Well, let's just say that one place is as good as the next. Oh, you can't go back, huh? Trouble? In a way. Ah, 
Look, your friend's just come in, Mr. Farley. Listen, you be careful with him. Dake can get awful me. Well, doesn't he take orders from Clanton, too? Don't talk smart like that to him. It riles him. Ah, Mr. Farley. Good evening. Would you join us? No. I just come to say, don't you get no ideas about Lila. Now, what ideas do you think I'd have? I'm telling you. You're telling me what? Keep your hands off my girl, you understand? My dear fellow, I haven't touched your girl. The thought never entered my mind. We were just having that drink, Dake, like Clanton Lila, said. Lila, you That's keep a... out of this. You know that I find your manner toward this young lady rather offensive. Well, you're just asking for trouble, aren't you? Not at all. Now, you think you can come in here with your fancy talk, your fancy ways, and make a fool out of me? Now, maybe Frank's a sucker, but not me. I don't like you. I don't trust you one bit. Mr. Farley, it couldn't be of less consequence. What do you think of me? He'll kill you, you just shut like he... up. Oh, that I don't stand for. Chum. Oh, my God. Imagine it's broken. Now, if you don't mind, I'll relieve you of these. A chap of your disposition has no right running around with even one gun, let alone two. You should have killed him. What on earth for? Listen, there's two more besides Dake and Clatton. They'll get you. You won't have a chance. I think you'd better clear out before Mr. Farley stops bleeding. He's not going to be in a very nice mood. Where are you going? Down to Mr. Clanton's office. I've got to have a little talk to him. In a moment, we'll return to Frontier General. In the September 1st, 1958 issue of Broadcasting Magazine, WCBS Radio in New York took out a local ad touting their station as having the city's most persuasive radio salesman. They also hailed their star personalities like Jack Sterling, Lanny Ross, Jim Lowe, Martha Wright, and Galen Drake. More and more network programming was being left to local stations. William N. Robeson remembered that time. The American people got a new toy. The men who owned the toy knew it was going to cost a great deal of money. And so they phased out radio. I told you earlier the story of the $80 $80 savings they would make by moving suspense to New York. This is, they've got down to that. It got down from a 13 piece orchestra, to 11 piece orchestra, an 8 piece orchestra, to a trio, and finally to the organ. So it was that kind of attrition that occurred. And they killed it because you can spin records and you have a disc jockey, or you can automate the whole day's programming. And you have a newsman and a disc jockey, and you operate. Because people went home and looked at their new toy. They weren't listening to radio. And now, as I think I said, you have a generation of people who don't know how to listen, who must have a picture to bolster up there. And they, they miss the beauty of the human voice, which is something I think you always... Uh, well, they miss the sh- beauty of their own imaginations. It's too much effort to think. That tube is up there. You don't have to think at all. You just sit there and eat that stuff and drink that beer and, and get fat. But, you know, we're never going to pull those men off the moon. No, we got to go now to Mars. I don't know why. You know, you kill a lot of men that way eventually. But once you've made that step, you can't go back. You made the step to television, you can't go back to radio. A lot of us old poops will talk as we're talking now, but my 10-year-old son couldn't care less about that. Frontier Gentlemen lasted nine months. In November, the network announced it was dropping several shows, including Nora Drake, Our Gal Sunday, Backstage Wife, The FBI in Peace and War, Indictment, City Hospital, and Frontier Gentlemen. 